thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's been an amazing two days, and I'm sure the next two days will also be equally uh, equally wonderful. And uh, Joel is here, and he's going to speak about something related to where is Joel? Uh, it's not right. Not arrived yet. Okay, good. So I can say whatever I want. <laughs> so he's going to talk about Skolem uh, spaces, something tomorrow. And I'm going to talk about Skolem functions. So since I'm speaking before him, so this becomes the definition of the problem. And then Joel will have to redefine the problem. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, Synthesizing Skolem functions for first order formulas. And this is joint work with uh, Akshay. And this is uh, really uh, something that we've just started working on. So we have some preliminary results. Uh, you know, I'd be happy to discuss more with uh, you know, any of you if you have further ideas. I mean, there are lots of problems for which we don't have answers over here. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Okay, I guess setting up the context. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, first order logic is, of course, uh, a bedrock for formal reasoning. And, uh, you know, typically given uh, a formula in first order logic, we interpret it over a universe of elements and, you know, given interpretations of predicates, functions, and of course, propositional connectives and quantifiers. And uh, just to you know, sort of warm us up, uh, let us say that we are uh, the the universe over which we want to express some some property, some formula is the natural numbers, and let's say we have uh, a okay. All, all right, yeah, I'll I'll speak louder. And, and let's say we have uh, these predicates. That's There's a less than predicate. There's an equality predicate. I mean, everybody knows what they are when they're interpreted over the natural numbers. And let's say we also have some functions like the addition function. So binary function takes two natural numbers, gives another natural number. And uh, we can also have some constant functions. <clears throat> so the 0 and 1 are the constant symbols, 0 and 1. And the black, the, the red 0 and 1 are, sorry. The red 0 and 1 are the constant functions 0 and 1, the black 0 and 1 are the elements of the universe. And then we have, of course, propositional connectives. So I can construct a predicate like this, which, as you can see, has an application of a function and a predicate and some constants. And then this is a propositional connective. And then we could also have, of course, quantification over the elements of the universe. So this is standard first order logic. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the the set of uh, symbols with which we construct these formulas, other than the propositional connectives and the quantifiers, uh, I'll call them vocabulary. So these are the symbols that we are going to interpret. We are going to give an interpretation of the of each of these predicates, this function, and these constants. So the vocabulary we'll call it the set of symbols to interpret. And uh, a structure over which a given formula like this will be interpreted is basically uh, a universe. In this case, it's like natural numbers. And uh, you know the interpretation of all the uh, constants and the predicates in the vocabulary. Right? So this is very standard stuff. So if I give you a structure uh, corresponding to a vocabulary, and if I give you a formula corresponding to that vocabulary, then uh, you know, either that formula evaluates to true. I mean, in, in this case, this is a sentence. There are no free variables. So either the sentence will evaluate to true over that structure, or it will evaluate to false, right? So if I give you a structure and a sentence, one of these must hold. So this is standard first order logic. <clears throat> so now, uh, here is, uh, OK, I think that part will, is it possible to move that around? Probably not. Okay, that that's fine. Okay, so I, th I think it's a fun fact about first order logic. Uh, so, for example, uh, suppose I take this formula uh, in which I have colored the variables differently just to uh, 
be consistent with the rest of the presentation and also to denote that there are some universal variables and there are some existential variables and the structure of the quantifiers here is there are the universal variables before the existential variables, universal variables to the left of the existential variables. And so this formula is saying that, uh, you know, if some predicate holds, uh, like x plus z greater than zero, where, you know, this could be in general over all of these variables, then some other predicate holds, which could in general be over all of the variables. But I mean, throughout the presentation, I'm going to denote the existential variables in green and the universal variables in brown. And uh, if you think about it, what this formula is saying is that for given, for every value of x and z, I have to choose a value of y such that, you know, whatever this predicate evaluates to, whenever it evaluates to true, this side should also evaluate to true. So for every value of x and z, I have to choose some value of y. And this, you know, starts to smell something like, a function because for every value of x and y, I have, for every value of x and z, I have to choose a value for y. So it looks like I'm looking at a function from n cross n to n because the universe is the natural numbers over here. And uh, indeed, there are several such functions. So for example, I could say that, well, uh, remember, I mean, whatever term I form here, it has to be on the vocabulary and our vocabulary had plus and zero and one. Uh, it did not have multiplication and it did not have other uh, other constants like two. So for example, here is uh, here is one example of a term which when I interpret using the interpretation of the plus function, it actually gives me a binary function which takes in two natural numbers and gives me uh, a third natural number. Here is another one where this five is repeat is basically shorthand for one plus one plus one five times, and uh, as you can see that uh, you know there are really infinitely many such functions uh, built on the vocabulary using the interpretation that uh, the structure I'm using gives to these uh, function symbols and constant symbols. So there are you know very large number in this case infinitely many such functions which will serve this purpose. That if I choose y for every given value of x and z, if I choose y like this, or if I choose y like this, you can pick whichever is your favorite function. Uh, then indeed, uh, I, for every value of x and z, I will get a value of y which will satisfy this, which will satisfy this formula, okay? And uh, well, so, so these are uh, terms which when we interpret, uh, you know, give us functions from n cross n to n. Uh, but I could go one step further and say, okay, here's a program. It's a terminating program. And it takes two inputs, x and z, and then, you know, whatever, if some condition, then something else, else, something else. Uh, and this also defines a function which takes x and z and uh, returns a value, which I'm going to use for y. But uh, it's not clear that if the function that this represents can really be expressed as a term in the logic, okay? As a term over the vocabulary that uh, we are using over here. And we'll soon see that there are examples where uh, indeed I can find a function which I can write it out as a program like this, but I cannot express it using the vocabulary that uh, over which I'm working, okay? This is not very surprising. But the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, we are trying to find y as a function of x and z, and these functions can take different forms. They can be written as terms over the underlying vocabulary, or they can be written as programs, which may not have corresponding terms in the underlying vocabulary, but uh, they still represent functions. Okay? Uh, and indeed, uh, it is the case that uh, this formula holds uh, if and only if there exists a binary function of x and z, uh, which is such that when I substitute that binary function in place of y, uh, the formula holds, okay? And so if you look at this formula and this formula, uh, there is a bit of a difference here. There was an existential quantifier. That existential quantifier is gone over here. Uh, and the corresponding existentially quantified variable has been replaced by this function where this function symbol was not at all present over there, okay? Yeah, so so that would become second order, right? Yeah, so 
yeah, in second order, we could say that there exists an F such that the second term is true. But if I want to stay within first order, I'll have to say that I'm introducing one more function symbol in the vocabulary, and there is an interpretation for that function which will which will do this. Right? Yeah, but in, if if you write it in second order, it's exactly saying as there exists F. Uh, but uh, I mean, note that, that there exists F shows up here to the left of these, whereas this was to the right of these, right? Okay, so, uh, so this is basically saying that we are trading off quantifiers for function symbols, and this is a very standard thing that we do in first order logic when reasoning about first order logic. Uh, and really, uh, you know, this kind of expresses what you know what what this whole business of trading of quantifiers for function symbol does, and I think it might be a good idea to parse this uh, a bit carefully. So so let me go over it. So I'm saying for every x, so I'm given this formula phi with x and y. So the variables are separated into two partitioned into two groups x and y. And for every x, uh, as long as there is a y which makes phi x y true we want to say that phi of x of x is also true. And of course, the implication in the other direction is trivial. If phi of x of x is true, then certainly there exists a y such that phi of x, y is true. So we are not saying that for every x exists y, phi x, y, if and only for every x, phi x, f x. The for all x is, the, the scope of the for all x is over this entire formula here, right? And this is important because what it means is that if for a certain x, there is actually no y which satisfies phi x y, then it doesn't matter what the function f evaluates to for that x because there is no y which will satisfy phi x y. Uh, but if for some other x, there is a y says that phi x y evaluates to true, then for that value of x, f x should give me something interesting says that phi of x of x is true. So it's really saying that I don't require that for every x there be a y says that phi of x y is true. But for whichever x is there is a y says that phi of x y is true, fx better give me a good value, a, a value for which phi of x of x is true. And for the other x's for which there is no y, I, I don't really care what fx gives me because every fx is the same as any other, right? So 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 the scope of this for all x is over this entire formula, and it's not just over this, okay? And uh, it turns out, uh, you know, this is a classical result in first order logic that for every first order logic formula phi x y, uh, there always exists, and if I'm going to, you know, separate the variables like these, for all x there exists y, so there always exists an x array function f, uh, which will satisfy this. So, so note once again that this is regardless of whether for all x there actually exists a y which makes phi x y true. It, it could be the case that only for one of the x's in the entire universe there exists a y that says that phi x y is true, but all we are requiring is that this function should give me the right value for that value of x. For the others, it doesn't matter. And even for that value of x, there may be multiple y's that make phi x y true. We are just saying that give me a function which gives at least one such good or correct value for x, for, for y, okay? And uh, such functions are also called scolem functions. This is for y in terms of x. And uh, this is actually closely related to choice functions in axiomatic set theory, a uh, very close connection. And, uh, you know, and, and of course, if you, if you look at uh, set theory with choice functions, ZFC, this is one of the axioms, axiom of choice, right? Uh, but what we want to ask is that, can we that we can use algorithms to construct this function? So we first want to ask, is the function computable? And of course, I think for the audience here, it should not be very hard to guess that no, this function is not always computable because you know the, the space of all possible functions is very large. 
uh, and then can we express it as a term in the logic? Uh, we'll soon see that it, the function may exist, but it cannot, it may not be at all expressible as a term in the logic. And uh, then the most general question that we are asking is that, uh, you know, we know this function exists, but, and we, we know that this function may not always be computable, but even when it is computable, it may not be expressible as a term in the logic. But then what is the best that we can ask for that, is there a Turing machine which computes this function? And can we algorithmically synthesize such a Turing machine? Which means that if I give you this formula, if I tell you what the variables x and y are, can I come up with a Turing machine which will take x and it will always halt for every value of x and it will output a value which I can always substitute for the value of y and, and this equivalence will hold, right? So uh, as we will see that uh, the answers to all of these questions are no, uh, not surprising, uh, but there's still some something interesting over there and we can actually characterize when some of these answers are yes and it turns out that Uh, you know, Thorab Skolem and Jack Harbrand, they actually, you know, I mean, we have the uh, Lowenheim Skolem theorems, which make use of, uh, of these Skolem functions. Then we have Herbrand's theorem, uh, how to instantiate quantifiers. So, so there's a lot of work done on this. Uh, but all of that work really focuses on existence of these functions, not on how to compute them. Okay, and how to compute them algorithmically, right? I mean, we will see that, I mean, this, this scenario is very, very nuanced. Uh, it could very well be the case that we know that there is a Turing machine which computes the Skolem function, but there may not be any algorithm to get the Turing machine. So there is no Turing machine which outputs that Turing machine. So it, it's really a very nuanced landscape, <clears throat> okay? And it turns out that, you know, this study of Skolem functions, uh, what we know as Skolem functions today, uh, can be traced even further back. But of course, you know, I mean, even before Skolem came up with this idea, so of course, at that time, they were not called Skolem functions. Uh, but, uh, you know, as early as uh, Boole, George Boole and Lowenham, they were trying to construct Boolean unifiers, which has a very close connection with Skolem functions. They're not the same as Skolem functions, but there, there's a close connection. So, uh, I mean, this slide is just to say that there's a long history for, the, yeah. Uh, why do you want to get rid of existential quantifiers for people that are interested? Oh, so no, they're, they're just the, you know, mirror images of each other. You could. Yeah, you, yeah, but wait, why not all quantifiers? Oh, why quantifiers? not all quantifiers? Then we could reduce first order logic to, you know, th then we would not need any quantifiers in first order logic. People were living a long time without quantifiers. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, in, in some sense, uh, this is to simplify the the structure of the formula that on which you want to apply for the reasoning, and this is really saying that whatever you can do with uh, existential quantifiers, you can replace them with functions, and then you don't need to worry about them. And then, uh, you know, I mean, if you look at this uh, Skolem normal forms, which are basically saying, remove all the existential quantifiers, replace them by functions. And school technique, I think it's, you know, almost all automated first order theorem provers will go through this step of scolemization. Uh, why did they not remove the universal quantifiers as well? Then uh, I guess we would not be talking about the entire universe at all, right? We would just be talking about, uh, I mean, there would be no bound variables. Everything would be, right? I, I, okay.
Okay. No, no, I mean, feel free to add to what I said. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, uh, so the question is that, well, I mean, we know that scolem functions exist and these are very useful in reasoning about first order logic. Uh, but why do we care about, you know, getting Turing machines which compute these scolem functions? So it turns out that this is also a very, very practically useful uh, thing. So for example, uh, program synthesis, program repair, uh, reactive controller synthesis, Decision procedures, you know, I, I can give you a first order logic formula and you might say, yes, this formula is valid, but then what is the certificate that that formula is valid? And scolem functions actually provide the certificate. And you, you can plug in the scolem functions and then it becomes just universal reasoning. Uh, so, so, so this is actually useful in a lot of practical applications. And here is just one very simple example of this that suppose uh, suppose I want to construct, and this is of course a very toy example. Suppose I want to construct a program that computes a function g x one x two, and this is kind of the relation that I want to have between the output of the function g x one x two, the output of the program that I wish to construct, and the input. So I, whatever the program computes should be greater than or equal to x one, should be greater than or equal to x two, and it is either equal to x one or equal to x two. And let's say x one and x two are natural numbers. So you can see that I'm really talking about the max function, the maximum of x1 and x2. But this is a, a first order logic specification saying that give me a function which satisfies these properties. And this is immediately like saying that for all x1, x2, I need a y which satisfies this. And once I get the scolem function for y as a Turing machine, this becomes the program that computes, uh, that, that computes this function gx1. Gx one x two, okay. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of prior work on this. You know, particularly if instead of first order logic we are talking about propositional logic, there is really a lot of work that has happened on this, uh, including work that uh, Akshay, I, and some other colleagues have done, uh, but others have also done. Uh, and beyond propositional setting for certain specific theories like linear uh, linear rational arithmetic or bit vectors, uh, there has been work done on how to compute the, how to get uh, programs which compute the scolem functions or terms which if we uh, evaluate them, interpret them, they give the scolem functions. Uh, first order constraint solvers, of course, there's a large body of work where you basically have a first order cons constraint and there's some free variables and then you try to find values of the free variables which would make the formula true. Uh, and you know some partial approach for quantifier elimination has also been looked at in the first order setting. So this is just to sh say that uh, you know we are not the first ones to look at this problem. This really has a long history of work. Okay, uh, so the next point that I want to make is that scolem functions are often conflated with terms in the logic, uh, which means that Whenever we have a formula in which there's an existentially quantified variable and I want to replace that with a function, you know, the, the first attempt is to try to write that function as a term in the logic, but unfortunately, uh, any such attempt is doomed in general. And here is a simple uh, example. So we're looking at Pressburger arithmetic and here is uh, a, a formula and I want to find Y as a function of X and Z. And it turns out that, uh, you know, here I can write it as uh, a term in the logic. For this particular formula, I can write it as a term in the logic, and so this is good, okay? But now consider this other formula, which is uh, actually similar to what we just saw, saying that for every x and, so this is the max function again, for every x and z, I need a y, which is either x or z, and it is greater than or equal to both x as well as z. So this is clearly the max function, but, the question is, can we represent the max function as a term in Press Pressburger logic, right? I mean, the only function symbol I have at my disposal is plus, and these are the constants zero and one. Max is nonlinear, so there is actually no way to write this. So I know that there exists a scolem function. In fact, we can all see it, it's staring at us what the scolem function is, but it cannot be written as a term in this logic, right? So, uh, right, yeah. And, but of course, if I say that, can I write it as a Turing machine? Of course, I mean, there's a very simple program 
that will compute this. And it turns out that for Pressburger logic, uh, for Pressburger arithmetic, if you incorporate uh, these two extra function symbols in the vocabulary, max and min, uh, that's actually sufficient to compute all these Fulham functions. Uh, uh, I think even with max, you'll be able to do it because min can be expressed as max. Uh, but that's a very special case where I'm saying that there is a vocabulary and I know that not all scolem functions can be written as terms over that vocabulary, but there is a limited extension of that vocabulary uh, with efficient interpretations of those functions, max and min, which actually allows me to write every scolem function as a term in that extended voca vocabulary. Uh, so th this is a very special case of that. Whether we can do it for arbitrary vocabularies, for which vocabularies we can do it completely open. I mean, we don't know, okay, for which book. Pardon me? Efficient interpretation means the function that I'm giving max. So there is uh, a Turing machine which will calculate that function efficiently in polynomial size of the inputs, right? Uh, but I mean, whether we can do this for arbitrary vocabularies, it's not clear at all. Okay, so uh, so therefore, uh, you know, for the purpose of this talk, we are actually going to restrict ourselves to viewing scolem functions as Turing machines, saying, are there halting Turing machines which compute the scolem function? Okay, those other questions of whether there are terms using efficiently, uh, I mean whether there's an extension of the vocabulary using efficiently interpretable functions and whether there are terms I'm not going to cover in this talk. In fact, we don't know much about those, uh, okay? But going beyond terms is not new. There has been some earlier work like conditional statements. Uh, so, but anyway, we, we'll see that even when we view these as Turing machines, there are a lot of limitations. We can't always construct Turing machines to do these, uh, to evaluate these column functions. So let's get into that, right? So, so now that uh, we are saying that we're going to look at scolem functions as Turing machines, uh, we're going to ask that can we always synthesize scolem function? So I give you a first order logic formula on a vocabulary interpreted over a structure. Can I construct a Turing machine that always holds for every element that I give from the universe? I mean, even with Turing machines, I won't be able to get it. So there's no hope of getting it using this interface. So once I get a Turing machine, what do I do with it, right? So, so think about this. Right? So in each of these applications, it may actually be okay to get a Turing machine. So I'm trying to synthesize a program it's okay to have a loop in that program and whatever, at least it'll compute, it'll halt and it'll compute, right? A controller synthesis, but of course, you know, reactive controller synthesis, if there are deadlines and all of that, then we would need, to... so, I mean, that's the next question to ask, that can I get a Turing machine and can I find out complexity bounds for how long is the Turing machine going to take to evaluate a function, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the first question we're asking is, can we even construct the Turing machine? And we'll see the answer is no. But then when can we construct the Turing machine? Uh, so for some uh, classes of logics, we can construct this. And uh, yeah, I mean, when we give the Turing machine, of course, there has to be a proof that the Turing machine actually computes what it's supposed to. All right. Uh, gone through these, uh, right? Uh, so can we always synthesize column functions as Turing machines, which means that is there a theory and a formula in that theory for which no Turing machine serves as, as a scolem function? And unfortunately, the answer to this is yes. Uh, and this is not some, you know, very abstract, obscure theory. <laughs> this is theory that we always use, natural numbers. You, you just add star in it multiplication in it, you don't even need less than. And uh, this, the proof is fairly straightforward, follows from the uh, uh, 
Matiasevich Robinson Davis Putnam theorem, which shows that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's basically recursive enumerability of uh, uh, systems of polynomials, right? So, uh, so this is bad news because here is something, uh, here is something which is a very useful theory. And uh, I know that I will not be able to compute scolding functions as Turing machines once I start giving you arbitrary formulas in this theory. So, so therefore, we have to now ask that, okay, you know, what are the right questions to ask such that, I mean, this is already out of our, uh, you know, equal to plus star zero one is looks like is already out because we cannot find a Turing machine which will always, which will serve as, we cannot, for, it's not the case that for every formula there is a Turing machine which will serve as a scolding function. So what can we do? So here is a kind of the formal problem statement we are uh, asking. We are saying that, well, suppose I give you a vocabulary V. I give you a computable V structure. So what is a computable V structure? Remember, a structure has a universe uh, and it has interpretations of the functions and the predicates. So the universe, if it is finite, well, I can just give the enumeration. If it is uh, infinite, we are saying it's uh, it, it's the natural numbers, right? So basically, uh, enumerable universe. And the interpretations of the functions and the predicates are computable. That's what it means to say that we have a computable structure, right? So basically, I give you halting Turing machines for interpreting each function, for interpreting each predicate. You provide the plug in the values from the universe. It will halt and it will tell you for each predicate whether it's true or false, for each function what, what is the output. Okay. So I give you a vocabulary, I give you a computable structure over that vocabulary, and I give you a formula on that vocabulary in which uh, the variables are separated into these universal and existential ones. And here's the first question that I ask that uh, is there a Turing machine? Uh, of course, this Turing machine is going to depend on the formula. And it's also going to depend on the structure on which I'm going to evaluate uh, the formula. So is there a Turing machine that serves as a scolem function uh, for these existentially quantified variables in this formula uh, when it is evaluated over the structure m? Okay. Now, why is it important to say that when it is evaluated over the structure m? Because remember, uh, this vocabulary may have a lot of predicates and function symbols in it. And it is okay for this Turing machine to make use of those predicate and function symbols. All of them are computable, so it doesn't take away computability, right? And the second question we want to ask is that, is there an algorithm which will actually re return this Turing machine? It will take this formula and it will return this Turing machine, right? So this is, we are saying the scolem function itself has to be a Turing machine, but can the Turing machine be algorithmically generated. So is there a Turing machine which generates that Turing machine, no matter what formula I give, can it generate that? Because this would really be the useful case, right? Otherwise I can do it only for one formula. <clears throat> and so uh, so this problem, we, we say scolem exists. This problem we call scolem synthesis. And the first question is that, can scolem exist return no? Which means that are there theories and formulas and structures for which there is no Turing machine? And I think I have now repeated this many times. So the answer to this is yes, it can return no. And then the second question we ask is that, uh, is it even decidable? So can I tell you whether it will be, is there an algorithmic way to say whether it's going to be yes or no? And if the answer is yes, so of course, if the answer is no, there is no question of having an algorithm that will give you a Turing machine because it doesn't even exist such a Turing machine. Uh, but if the answer is yes, uh, then is it the case that, which means that there exists a Turing machine, but I cannot algorithmically generate this for every possible formula that you give me. Can scolem synthesis return no? And uh, when exactly does it return yes? And when exactly can we synthesize it algorithmically? And uh, that's, th that's the question that we are asking. So basically, we want a program to construct these programs which will serve as colon functions, okay? Uh, so, so this is the next few slides. 
the next few slides, I'm going to really. us to return no you just need one binary predicate in the vocabulary and that's it that's damaging enough right and this is really saying that uh, any hope of trying to you know have a subclass which just depends on the arity of the predicate ha having a subclass where the answer would be yes uh, and the subclass is just restricted by the arity of the predicates is not going to be possible uh, turns out that we can't even decide when this, we can't algorithmically say when the answer is going to be yes or no. Uh, and this also happens for very simple vocabulary structure. Uh, I need a single predicate and a constant, uh, a single binary predicate and a constant. Uh, the quantifier prefix uh, also doesn't need to be very complicated, just with exists for all exists, for all exists exists. This is good enough to give us undecidability. Uh, interestingly, for uh, this exist plus for all star, at least one existential, well, if there were no existential quantifiers, then it wouldn't need to generate any colon function. So there has to be at least one existential quantifier. Uh, but if it is of this form, if your uh, formula is of this form, basically there are no universal quantifiers to the left of the existential quantifier. I'm just trying to find the constants. Uh, then uh, it turns out to be decidable. And then uh, there is, uh, one class, I guess, which would really complete this entire scenario for which we don't know. If it's just a single for all and a single exists, we do not know, right? Uh, you put an exists before this, uh, we know it's undecidable. You, we put an exists after this, we know it's undecidable. Uh, but just a single for all, single exists, we don't know. Okay? Uh, and, you know, as I was saying, it doesn't take too much to hit these negative results. For example, here is a very funny situation where my vocabulary has only monadic predicates and equality. Uh, and we know that there always exists a Turing machine, which will, so, so you give me any formula over a vocabulary which has only monadic predicates and equality. Uh, there always exists a Turing machine, but I cannot algorithmically generate the Turing machine, okay? Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a typo there. So it's always answers yes, but not. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, so many negative results. Yeah. Okay. We did not put any restrictions on the structure of the specification. We had, I mean, we could look at further restrictions like what you're saying, but currently this talk is about just looking at the vocabulary structure, looking at the quantifier prefix. Uh, can we go further? So, so it turns out that, you know, here itself there is some some nice positive results. So not everything is negative, uh, but yeah, we could explore guarded fragments as well. Right, so, uh, but many theories do admit algorithmic synthesis of scolem functions. I mean, we just saw Pressburger admits. So what's happening? I mean, can we really, yeah. Which, what is guaranteed to be decidable?
a distinction because there are theories which are not decidable, but their elementary diagrams are decidable. Right? Or, or the other way around, I think, the theories which are decidable, but the elementary diagrams. Yeah, so I'm coming to that, the next slide. Yeah, so, so this is uh, a notion from model theory. So I'll just use one slide to just explain what elementary diagram is. Right, so, so let's look at our favorite vocabulary, right, the Pressburger vocabulary. And uh, what is the structure on over which I'm going to interpret this vocabulary? So uh, the universe is the integers, both positive and negative integers. Uh, there's the usual less than interpretation, usual equal to interpretation, interpretation of plus and interpretation of a constant zero and one. And uh, the theory of this structure this vocabulary and the structure. And then I expand the vocabulary to have a separate constant symbol for each element in the universe. Okay, so I'll have a constant symbol called C zero, corresponding to the element zero in the set of integers. I'll have a con constant symbol called C one, constant symbol called C minus one. So for every element in the universe, I'm going to introduce a separate constant symbol. So of course. Now this vocabulary has become, I and mean, remember all our structures are countable, so this universe is countable. So now we have a countable and finite vocabulary. And then we are going to, of course, if the vocabulary has increased, we have to give the interpretations of these new constant symbols, but the interpretations of these new constant symbols are going to be exactly what we would expect them. They are the constants, they are the elements of the universe, you know, which, which form the subscript over there. And the rest of it is, of course, just the same, right? Because once I interpret these constants to, eval to evaluate to those elements of the universe, then I can keep the interpretation of the uh, rest of the function and predicate symbols the same. Uh, but note that this is, of course, closely related to this, but it is not the same as this. This has additional constant symbols, and they have to be interpreted. and uh, the set of all true sentences in this expanded vocabulary and the structure corresponding to this expanded vocabulary is called theory of this expansion of the structure and this is also called the elementary diagram form okay so there is a slight difference they are not exactly the same okay and uh, the elementary diagram is said to be decidable if i give you any sentence in a uh, in uh, so the elementary diagram is decidable. If I give you any sentence over this expanded vocabulary, we can algorithmically decide whether that is true or not. So this is the usual way of defining the theory of a structure. Here, the structure itself has been expanded. So this is elementary diagram. Yes. Yeah. So the constant symbol is the one Yeah. No, no. So, so are you asking why are they? Why are these two different? Yeah. 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 I mean, I just wonder who. No, no, no. So, so, so the point is, 
you could construct sentences. Uh, so every sentence in this not true the other way around. Yeah, and then you have to. Yeah. So what you're saying is that if you start from a sentence over here, so 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 think about it this way, right? That suppose I give you a sentence over there, so that by itself is not a sentence over here because it, it has extra things, right? Now, if I ask you that, so, so what you're suggesting is that I'm going to replace the, right? Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the formula changes. The, the formula, the structure of the formula changes. So if so, if I want to represent minus one, I have to say that there exists an x as that x plus one equals zero. So the formula is changing. There are new quantifiers coming in which are getting nested in different ways and right it, it that that would be very very easily fit into that if it was just natural if you if you add a minus, yes, so then you could directly uh, do it. But in general, you, you cannot retain the same structure of the formula, right? Yeah. OK. OK, all right. Uh, and this turns out to be a necessary and sufficient condition for synthesis when we are talking about computable structures. Okay. So the Skolem synthesis problem, which is as given that we know that for every formula, there is a Turing machine which serves as the Skolem function. Can we algorithmically synthesize it? This has a positive answer if and only if the elementary diagram of M is decidable and the proof is constructive. Uh, and so we can actually effectively synthesize these as halting Turing machines. It's not just the, the proof, yeah. No, the original logic is embedded inside the elementary diagram, right? Yeah, other way around, yes, indeed, there are. So the elementary diagram is decidable that the original theory has to be decidable. But the original theory can be decidable, but the elementary diagram may not be decidable. And, and we have examples. Yeah, I, so, yeah. So, so there are examples. I mean, it's, it's. I mean, you, you, you. Pardon me. Pardon me. No, no, no. no, no there, there is an explicit construction. Yeah. So I can show it to you. I mean, we have to construct the universe in a particular way. We have to use. Yeah. Yes, so in a practice, probably these two things coincide in a lot of cases. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, so Felipe has an example for you. So, I mean, you have to construct it. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, for a lot of theories, they actually coincide, right? But there are.
theories for which they don't coincide. And the decidability of the original theory is not sufficient to give you algorithmic synthesis. You need decidability of the elementary diagram. Yeah, thanks. All right. So, uh, so here are some consequences. I mean, this one, uh, I mean, it turns out that the elementary diagram is not decidable. So immediately we say that it's a negative answer. Uh, here are some theories for which the elementary diagram is decidable. So Pressburger, linear rational, real algebraic, dense linear orders without endpoints. And so what our result says is that for all of these, you can have algorithmic synthesis of scolin functions. So it's not as bad. Um, you know, we, we can still do it for a lot of theories that are, are used out there. The, the first three, I see, the first three example, I see them as a, a computable structure. But the fourth is a family of structures. Mm -hmm. So you mean that for every one of them or for? Uh... Uh, so this is uh, the density comes from the rational, yeah, and uh, so it is enumerable but a dense linear order without endpoints. So it it is one structure, right? It's a well, it's the order with the S. So I guess these are several structures. Which one? This fourth, the fourth one? Yeah. Yeah, so the fourth one, uh, oh, dense linear orders. No, it should be order. Okay, yeah. so the rational. Yes. And uh, the whole, the whole isomorphic to the... Uh... It's isomorphic to the rationals, yeah. It's countable and dense, yeah. Yeah, did my teacher? Yeah. yeah. So, it's, yeah, it should be order, not orders. Dense linear order without endpoints. Yeah. But countable. Uh, and uh, in each of these cases, it actually reduces to the decidability of the underlying theory. Uh, but the decidability of theory is not good enough. There exist structures where uh, this is decidable, but this is not as, right? Yeah. Pardon me? I can't hear you, Kapoor. There's only one isomer. Yes. Oh, you don't need countable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it will all be isomorphic to that. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. True. Okay. So. Uh, so how how much time does it take to compute these Colum functions using these Turing machines? So the lower bound follows from. The complexity of deciding the theory, you can reduce the decision problem uh, for a formula in theory, the decision problem for the theory to computing scolem functions. And for the upper bound, uh, you know, we actually don't have very comprehensive results. I mean, if the theory admits effective constraint solving, which means that you give a formula with a free variable and there's an algorithm which tells you the value of the free variable. I mean, this is true, for example, for uh, linear programming and even nonlinear programming for certain classes, then we can give some upper bounds too, but these upper these bounds are like very far apart. So we don't know how to close them. So to conclude, uh, we we presented a framework to study the algorithmic computation of scolem functions as Turing machines. And uh, we gave this characterization uh, of when it can be algorithmically synthesized. Uh, so this work appeared uh, last year at MFCS, and there we considered several other special cases of it. Uh, remember, we said you start with a vocabulary structure and a formula. So we can say, okay, let's keep the formula fixed, and let's vary the structure, or let's keep the structure fixed, and let's vary the formula, and then uh, you know you get some further finer uh, picture of the landscape. Uh, but yeah, I think you know the the most questions are uh, open over here. That uh, can we find out scolem functions? Can we find out Turing machines with you know better complexity? Can we say anything? I mean, currently the lower and upper bounds are really bad. I mean, very far apart. And the upper bound we can only have it for cases where uh, I mean, currently our work we can only have it for cases which where the theory admits con effective constraint solving. For the other cases, we don't know. Uh, this would be super uh, interesting that when are terms sufficient uh, and is there simple extension of the vocabulary uh, with 
efficient interpretations of the additional functions such that terms are sufficient, we do not know. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also kind of curious how this works out for some special theories like strings and all. I mean, I was talking to Anand yesterday, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with chat GPT. So you can think of chat GPT as a for all x exists y formula where you are giving the x, you're giving the prompt, and chat GPT is returning you the y, except that nobody knows what the specification is. Nobody mm -hmm. knows what phi is, right? But, uh, you know, if we can specify it, then we can actually come up with a competitor for chat GPT. And uh, you, you give a query, it's a string, and then there is another string that comes out of it. Efficiently, cal efficiently computed. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But what I'm saying is that the, the theory of strings is actually a very interesting theory in which to apply this. It's basically saying that I have like fill in the blanks in a formula and I'm going to fill in the X's and the Y should get automatically filled in. So this is different from the satisfiability question where I'm asking, is there a way to fill in the blanks? Here I'm saying this is one part which I'm going to turn and the other part should get automatically fixed. Okay, so I'll stop there. So I'll stop there. So we have time for questions. Uh, I will ask you if you're in the back to use the Zooming voice so that everyone can hear the question. And if you're in the phone, to use the Zooming voice so that everyone in the back can hear <laughs> So what's the. Uh, yeah. It's past my. Phone. I know. It's past my. Phone. It's always. Uh, so your characterization concerns the whole theory. If, yeah. What if I restrict to sigma two sentences and the sigma two diagram or replace two by any other number that you like? So sigma two, I showed you, right? Oh, sorry. So the restriction you want to put is on the quantifier prefix? Uh, the restriction would be, I want to have uh, scolem functions for simple formulas only. Mm -hmm. and so I simplify the, the problem. And if is the characterization, then I would kind of expect the characterization then to be if a restriction of the elementary diagram to simple oh, formulas is decidable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we haven't explored that. So instead okay. of decidability, you're saying that if it lies... Level by some kind. Yeah, of. it's a, a finer view of... Right. Yeah. Uh, we No, we haven't looked at that. We haven't looked okay. at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any question? Yeah. Sorry. So did you say something about the proof or did I miss it? The proof is there in additional slides. Okay, okay. Uh, so the proof is, uh, I can sort of tell you the general structure of the proof. I mean, basically using the, de the decidability of the elementary diagram, we know that if we start enumerating things in a particular way, we are eventually going to be able to. So, so the Turing machine that we currently construct is an enumeration with the guarantee that it always terminates. But complexity, I mean, we have no idea. Okay. We have absolutely no idea. I mean, you know, at, at a rough level, you can think of that, I'm, I'm trying to find out a Turing machine which given X will give me Y. So I can start enumerating the Ys in a particular order. And because the theory is decidable for every y that I pick up, I can go back and ask, is the formula true mm. for these values of x and y? And I have some guarantee that, you know, at some point, I will find out a criteria where I can stop. Mm. So, so it's really enumeration in the worst possible way, right? We just start enumerating knowing that we are always going to stop. So this is, if you are guaranteed that, it, that, that the answer to that SKSN is yes, is... If you know that this is the construction of the Turing machine. So so this is the Turing machine that will evaluate the scolem function. Mm. 
And now, because this is of a, such a simple structure, it's saying that just keep enumerating in a in a certain order. And at every step, you go back and invoke the decision procedure of the elementary diagram. If, if a solution exists, then you're guaranteed to find it. Yeah. Uh, if Yeah, so this is only if Scolem exists is... Is, is uh, true, is yes. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to say, I, I'm going to synthesize it using machine learning when it exists. Long live India and France friendship.